Hello YouTube, today I want to speak and share my knowledge about Mini DV. It's a very peculiar subject and considered an art in some cases. But yeah, over the years in college I studied BTEC Media and I learned a lot of stuff from that course because we used Mini DV or HDV at, at the time. We kind of mix between both. So I picked up quite a few different little things about how Mini DV works and the technology behind it, what to do and what not to do, how people used to have the workflow of Mini DV. And then I just want to kind of share my thoughts about why people use it in today's world, um, mostly art, but I'll get to that later on. Um, and just how to capture uh, different fittings and uh, different little tips and the finite little details that a lot of other videos I think personally don't touch on and it's kind of it is very very in-depth and very hard to explain so bear with me I'm sorry if I stutter a lot I haven't scripted this I've just got the notes that I've made so I really hope that you can understand what I'm trying to convey here. So yeah, please grab yourself a drink. It's probably going to be a little while because there's a lot to talk about and a lot that I want to share. And this is because I watched a video from iHotch recently about Windows 11 and not supporting Firewire. Um, again, he heard it from someone else and it is kind of true, but kind of not. Um, I've recently discovered that it is possible and it's been the same as years have gone on, it's always been a rumour, oh, the new Windows doesn't support Firewire and everything else. So yeah, this is what this video is about, is just sharing my knowledge about mini DV camcorders, etc. Uh, I've never really personally used it, so please take my knowledge as a grain of salt, and please correct me where I'm wrong, because there's some stuff that's just way beyond me, and I'll probably admit that in some of some of this video is that some of the stuff I don't really understand what's going on but I know how to make it work at least um, especially for myself so hang in there and we'll start off with the first subject so the next thing I want to talk about is several different little tips about how to use mini DV uh, just little things that I've picked up along the years with being at college and skater friends who have learned their own little way and of course like all the popular ones like Beagle there's the Scooter World with um, Ryan Nug, uh, Badger Clit, as he calls himself. There's several other people who I'm obviously not referring to, but there's loads of them out there. Skate Rat, Shane Uckland, I think his name is. Um, who, Yeah, he films Corey Kennedy. He's well into it. Um, but yeah, these are the sort of things that I recommend for anyone who's starting out with Mini DV. Um, all the cameras pretty much look the same. Now, I can say this out of my own experience because I've only ever really used small mini DV camcorders. I've not used the bigger uh, camcorders like the Sony VX, Canon XM1 or 2, uh, any of the others that exist. I've always just stuck with the smaller ones because these are less more evasive. People don't realize that it's camera. Even if they do, they're not intimidated by it. They're not like, oh, what are these uh, douchebags up to in the streets with a big camera? Because you've got to you got to consider when out on the streets, especially is when you turn up with a massive camcorder. Um, people think you're the real deal. People honestly do. And they you know they try and photobomb you or they uh, security will be like, have you got a permit to be here, etc. But when you have something small like this. They're a lot less like intimidated or uh, alerted by what you have, you know. They're like, oh, these are just some kids trying to make some video. And why I say it doesn't look any different is because with the videos that I have made with mini DV or low res sort of stuff, I've always had comments like, oh, that looks like a sick VX. And it's like, I've never owned a VX. I, other than this one, I've owned a Canon. MVX3i, I believe that's the one, I'll put it up on the screen, whatever I'm referring to. Um, but yeah, I had that one, it kicked the bucket because the screw got loose and it rattled around and shorted it out and died. Um, but yeah, this is very similar. It's 
they're not great cameras. The sensors are tiny. They're, what, a third of an inch or something like that? It's just the technology of it kind of inside them and the, like, the creature comforts, like, iris control and, you know, little switches, ND filters. I'm sure if you know camcorders, you would know what I'm referring to. But the smaller ones, they're a bit bit more fiddly with the settings, etc. But with the bigger ones, you have a lot more options and ease of use. But honestly, like, as long as you have a mini DV camcorder that's in good condition, you should be good to go. And as long as you can slap a fisheye on, which I will talk about different fisheye attachments and stuff. But as long as you can fit a fisheye onto it and you're happy with it, that's all that matters. There's a few cameras I do recommend, uh, like types of cameras. One, again, for the reason just stated, smaller camcorders, they're just less intimidating, easier to carry around. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. The one thing you do want to look out for when looking at these camcorders is the sensor. Now, this one's just a basic CCD sensor. Um, but the, the better ones are the free CCD. Now, all that means is that for each color, red, green, and blue, the primary colors, you have a much better, clearer color, accurate image. Um, they're just generally better. So if you can find one of those, which they do exist in these smaller ones, I think it's the Panasonic NV series and GS series, they're really good. Um, but all the, you know, prosumer ones, you know, the bigger camcorders, they pretty much all have free CCD sensors in them and they just look incredible in my opinion uh, if you if you don't know this part of cameras these sensors back in the day were incredible and in my eyes they still are incredible i don't know any modern equivalents um, but a lot of cameras now use something called cmos now when you see cmos they are much higher resolution sensors like the one I'm using now on the A6100. Um, great image clarity, amazing colors. However, there is a little bit of a limitation to them and that's rolling shutter. Now, this is one of the things that I'm not an expert in. I just know why, you know, that CMOS does it and CCD doesn't. And it isn't that CCC doesn't do this, but in CMOS, whenever you do uh, panning, uh, on a camera, um, you if you go too fast, and it is only a small minute thing, this camera is notorious for it, um, but basically when you pan it kind of wobbles, so the vertical lines, say like a, a fence pole or something, you're panning like with the camera upright and it'll, it'll go like this. And now that I've told you, you, you won't unsee it. Any camera that uses a CMOS sensor pretty much does this. It's pretty much unheard of of a CMOS sensor not to have some degree of quite bad rolling shutter. And this is why, now this is a tip from camcorders of this age, is that's why they use these older cameras because the sensors are a lot less prone to rolling shutter. They still do it, but you have to, you know, you can be a little bit more mad with your camera swinging around and cool transitions that you set up. But CCD, you can look it up on YouTube, CCD versus CMOS, and you'll see the difference that it makes. Uh, did, I think I saw a video of some guy who had it mounted on his motorbike side by side, and the amount of image clarity that the CCD maintained was a lot better than the CMOS. And I, I really do hope that the, that the like action cameras, like the GoPros and stuff like that, aren't using CMOS because they're not. They're not great, especially for action. Um, they are, CMOS is incredible, don't get me wrong. Like, that's why I have one, is because the image clarity is just incredible. It's just that rolling shutter that really does let it down. But that is one of the high regarded tips are, is that, yeah, just make sure your camera has CCD, which is kind of hard not to find in these older cameras because it was so popular at the time. CMOS was very much a new thing in the HD world. So the HDV camcorders, they're the ones that were trying to step up to CMOS. I definitely realised it because my upgrade from the, I think, yeah, it was the Panasonic SD9 little camera. Um, 
I went up to the TM300, which had the free MOS sensor, which is free CMOS sensors for red, green, and blue. Again, I heard that advice back then, so I just went, oh, okay, it has free for red, green, and blue, it should be great. Colors were great, but yeah, rolling shutter was definitely an issue, and it wasn't until much later I discovered all my footage looked like crap because of the rolling shutter, because I always used to do these mad pans and everything. But yeah, good advice there is just go with a CCD, preferably the free CCD, which again, should be quite easy because these cameras are a dime a dozen nowadays. Another tip that I can recommend is using fresh tapes and fresh tapes only. This was something I picked up at college um, they never let us go out and film on the same tape twice. And the reason being is that old tapes or used tapes can wear out heads more. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but I can kind of understand it. You know, if there's data written on it, really, you don't really want to be writing two sets of datas onto the same tape. It, it can get confused, it can make glitches. It can cause a lot of headaches when you're trying to get your, you know, your shot, um, which is obviously in skateboarding, you can't afford to lose that opportunity if someone lands a trick and it glitches because you've used the same tape twice. Yeah. So yeah, I recommend if, you, if, you, if you're one of these people who have been using the same tape over and over and over and over again, get some fresh tapes. Now, there is a problem with that, especially in 2022, is that they're expensive. 100% really, really expensive. Uh, just because they're vintage. These things are vintage. Like these are, this one's probably like best part of 15 years old at least. So it's like you can, especially with the VX1, because that's what, 95 or something ridiculous? Like it's nearly 30 years old. Um, so yeah, like mini DV is just not, it's ancient technology. People aren't using it anymore. It's like VHS cameras as well. People, VHS tapes are diamond, well, no, sorry. VHS tapes, are, you know, you can't get hold of them anymore, especially new ones. So the only way around that is getting a tapeless option. Now, this has only happened in the last, I'd say 10 years that people have been uh, finding this out, is that you can use a Firewire external recorder and all this is is something that's is basically a set is basically essentially the a capture card that's portable. Um, so you, instead of capturing tapes, you're capturing live from the camera sensor, which is incredible. Um, I've got some video links that I'll probably put in the description. I think it was Shane Auckland. I'm pretty sure it was Shane who did them. But there's there's quite a few different videos. I'll put them down below. But he. They go through all the, the quirks of it, but they, I think they compare both tape and tapeless. Um, this is both obviously a working tape camera and then a tapeless uh, option. They look the same. And it just goes to prove that this isn't an analog format, it's digital. That's why it's exactly the same. As long as your camera is working pretty much flawlessly, it should be the same as tape as it is tapeless. Um, but, but these uh, tapeless recorders, basically they just capture the sensor live and record it to a compact flash most of them use. Compact flash was just a older SD card at the time. It was really popular. And these devices were obviously from around that time as well. But obviously no one in the skateboard world knew about them. Um, but yeah, they're, they're perfect options if you don't want to spend hundreds of pounds on tapes. Like, even in the past, people went through tapes like nothing. Um, and again, because they were using this advice of not using the same tape twice, which is good advice, I think. Um, and with that tapeless option as well, it takes out the whole headache of having to try and log your clips and know where they are or do the, you know, the handover, the fisheye sort of look. And that's why people did it. Is because obviously they would just hit record, keep it recording the whole session, and they would just put their hand over for a couple of seconds. So when they were trying to capture their footage, they would just fast forward, oh, my hand's there, that's a keep. And then they would, you know, capture that, that section of the tape. Um, but yeah, the tapeless option, obviously, 
disregards all that. It's all just separate clips. You don't have to, you know, log your footage like that. It, it takes a bit of the tediousness out of it because I feel like, especially when people want to get into it, especially in 2022, the, the whole workflow of it is just so old school and it is really tedious. And that's one of the opinions that I have is that you sh really shouldn't be filming with mini DV in 2022. There's plenty of camera alternatives that look pretty much identical to the Sony VX in my opinion. Um, and I've got proof of that with my old videos, people commenting on them saying, oh yeah, that's a sick VX. They, they don't really know anything about it, but it looks similar. That's all that matters. And as long as it looks cool, Again, that's all that matters to the people watching is like, oh yeah, that's a sick fisheye, you know? But yeah, the tapeless uh, option is definitely a route to go, especially if you want to use these older camcorders just for the, you know, authenticity and everything else. And I fully, I'm fully down with that. Um, personally, I've never used one of them, so I haven't really got any advice of which one. But I do know some of them. There's one from Data Video. There's a Sony one that's, you know, native to the cameras. And there's one more that I'm forgetting. It's a really weird off-brand, but it's it's great. Um, they do have their own little set of issues again, because I've never had one. I don't really know which sort of problems they would be. Um, I think there's some audio issues with one of them. But yeah, that's something you can obviously Google and research. But yeah, tapeless, great option. The next thing a lot of people advise, and I preach on this as well, is that if you are going to go down the route of using the actual tape functions, um, if your camera is well enough to do it, is to use a capture camera or an actual capture deck. Um, the decks, they are designed specifically just to capture. They can record footage to a tape as well. Not that that's any use today, because the likelihood of you coming across a mini DV player, very slim. Um, but yeah, having this, it just essentially means that, say if this is the one I go out to skate with and film on, this camera is dedicated to just filming. And some people even go out of their way to say, don't play back footage. You know, you know you've got the shot, wait until you're home and just take the tape out and you know, obviously capture it. And the reason for that is that, you know, especially if you have like a VX1000 that is really old and it's wearing out, you know, every time you record, every time you rewind, fast forward, playback, you are wearing out the tape heads. The tape heads are what reads the tape. Um, the motors wear out, uh, dirt gets in it, all of this stuff. And I fully recommend with everyone who uh, talks about this as well get yourself it doesn't matter what mini dv camera you get as long as it's your region so ntsc or pow i'm not going to discuss pow and ntsc here as long as you get it in as long as you get a camera that's in your country you should be good but basically you just want to capture on something else that's cheap and affordable that works um, just so you can you know keep your filming camera in the best condition possible because it won't last forever and this is something that the tape again with tapeless the the benefit of tapeless is that some people have been able to resurrect some of their old cameras that you know don't film mini dv anymore the, the, the motors are worn out doesn't do anything so they're able to utilize their cameras again because everything else about the cameras are good it's just a mini dv there's so many small intricate little parts that are impossible to replace because we're in 2022, but these cameras, they're not going to make replacement parts anymore. And even if they, if, even if you do find a donor camera or something else, it's going to cost you a fortune. You're probably better off just buying a working camera. But yeah, that's, that's another tip is just have a dedicated thing. And I, I do fully recommend the decks. Um, they work a lot better. There's a lot more functionality. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, they're incredible. And some of them even do the HDV as well. Those are the ones you kind of want to get. They're the more recent, more more durable and just better overall. The HDV's uh, format is amazing, in my opinion. Obviously now it's far from it, but 
that's the kind of uh, deck you want to get, just for the fact that they were manufactured a lot later. So you know, you're talking like uh, like late two thousands onwards. You know, that's when they were made and everything. So yeah, capture deck or a capture camera if you want if you're on a budget. Just a far better way to go. So the next thing I'll uh, touch on is fish eyes. Now the reason why people love the VX one thousand is because of a company named Sentry Optics. Now, there's a whole story somewhere on YouTube about the guy who made these fish eyes. He made them by hand, everything else. He, he re I think he recently like made a whole... I think he made a certain a limited number of uh, new fish eyes and people went nuts over it. Um, especially the filmmakers who like Beagle and Shane and uh, some of the more known skateboarding filmers out there. They just, they loved this opportunity and they got them. Um, but yeah, the, the whole reason why the BX1000 is loved is because of that company. They made a fisheye specifically for that camera at the time. Why he did it, again, you'll have to look at the YouTube video. I have watched it, but it's been a, been a long time since I've watched it. Um, but yeah, that was fairly recently, like in the last few years or something. But that's why the VX1000 is loved for what it is. Because that fisheye is just a perfect combination. You just zoom straight out, twist it on the bayonet fitting, and you're good to go. That's how good of a fisheye that is. Not only that, the quality. The quality of Sentry Optics is unparalleled to anything now, in my opinion. I have seen them. Some of the, yeah, the big ones, uh, ginormous. The, you've got the extreme fisheye. That's insane. Um, do I recommend getting them? Probably not. Uh, probably not worth your time and money unless you really want to get into it. Um, a lot of people use these like protectors on them now because again, these fish eyes are just like the cameras. They, they don't make them anymore. And that's why people went nuts over that guy making the last like 300 or something. But the fish eyes you kind of want are the ones like the Sentry Optics. Obviously they're not as good quality, I understand, but we're talking about 480i or whatever it is. You know, the resolution is fairly low. There's not really, in my opinion, not too much difference, and especially from the, like, from the viewer's perspective. They just don't see it. Like, only us film nerds and camera nerds know what fisheye it is, you know. You can tell if it's a cheap AliExpress fisheye just because of the way the, the sun comes through it and everything. So yeah, I personally, that's, that's somewhere where you can get them. AliExpress still sell fish eyes. Then obviously nothing like the Sentry Optics. Optica still make them. And they do all different types of sizes, um, different filter threads. Um, you can see this is a 37 mm um, filter thread size which is a common size for fish eyes, so you're good there. Um, you can get like little adapters and stuff, but just be wary and it's kind of like, you just have to kind of experiment with it because there's a lot of, there's a lot of fish eyes that need to be, you know, adapted or spaced out, uh, depending on how wide your actual camera lens is. Um, yeah, you just kind of have to toy around. It is quite an expensive endeavor, but don't worry, as long as you don't damage your fisheye when you receive it, you can always set it on somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I do recommend the those types of fisheyes, the ones that are, you know, kind of domed. They're going to give you the best sort of skater look, so to speak. The other ones that have like the macro adapter on them, they do work and I have used them, but they don't look the same and they definitely certainly don't feel the same at all. Um, it's kind of like a, a weird kind of like, it's almost like a phone filter almost. Like it isn't a real fish eye, so to speak. You want one of those domed sort of fish eyes. They give the best effect. I don't actually have one for this one, so I can't show you, but there's plenty of images that I'm probably showing on the screen for you now. Um, the magnification is the 0.3x. Um, that's just a, uh, again, I've only learned this in the last couple of years, is the magnification is the, like the, 
the field of view, so to speak. But 0 0.3 is basically your standard fisheye 180 degree fisheye, you know. So you'll be able to see everything that's 180. You can get 0 0.2, especially with these smaller cameras, you can get some really cool looking fisheyes. But yeah, it's totally up to you. But yeah, 0 0.3 or lower is going to give you more field of view, which does look way cooler in my opinion. Even on HD cameras, getting a fisheye adapter that just works is, is great. You just have to really, really toy with it. So yeah, just have fun and experiment with it and see what kind of fisheyes you can get. And just, yeah, just be wary of which filter size you need. You just need to look at the circle with the line for it. That's your filter size. So this one's 37. I think the VX is like 52 or 58. Um, yeah, another weird size is like a 49, but you rarely, rarely ever see that anymore. 48 is another one. 48 mil is really common. Is it? No, 43, sorry. 43 mil. So it goes 37, 43, 52, 58. Those are your four main sizes, I think it is. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I know there's plenty of fish eyes that are weird sizes because I've seen them. But yeah, fish eyes are one of the most annoying things with these sort of cameras, especially these cheaper ones. It's just experimenting with it until you find a decent one. So yeah, have fun. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how these work with, uh, with capturing and everything else. Uh, the cable that it uses is a firewire, so we're talking one of these to, I'll put it up on the screen, a, a bigger version. Um, so there's, firewire was basically a USB competitor, so a lot of, a lot of people used firewire back in the day because they were just putting it on things, most commonly the video camera, but you could find these with uh, hard drives, you, well external hard drives is what I'm talking about, the big brick hard drives. So you could attach firewire to a hard drive, to an audio deck, music equipment, uh, loads of little things because it was basically a USB alternative and a lot of people did adopt it but it never took off. Uh, you get two types of firewire, there's firewire 400 and 800. I've never personally seen Firewire 800. I think it might have been on one of the camcorders that, w that was at my college, but the I think I used it once. So I never really experienced that, and it never really took off from what I'm aware of, is Firewire 400 was the predominant uh, Firewire that was around. Now, this is where I get into the video to talk about what iHotch had a problem with, with his adapters and everything. Um, so people with these cameras nowadays, they want to capture the footage. They either use the composite capture devices, those are garbage, do not use them. They jeopardize so much quality that these cameras can actually capture. Um, those um, those, are the, those uh, composite cables you know, they're just a mushed video signal. Um, very convenient, don't get me wrong. And, you know, if you make it work like that, it's fine. But those cables only support up to like 480i or 576. It's not, and it's not a, a clean, yeah, it's more, more essentially, it's not a clean way of capturing your footage. Using the Firewire is like a USB cable, it's digital and everything else, it's a much cleaner image. The composite cables are like a radio signal almost. It's not that great. So I don't recommend using those. Uh, the next way that most people nowadays do capture footage, and iHotch uses this way, is a laptop and adapters. Now, a lot of people have laptops. I, I completely understand that they are very convenient for people, but the the, the adapters from what I've always seen people use them is they just don't work that well. They either have issues, um, drivers don't work, or they just straight up don't work at all. Um, iHotch had a 
like an audio sync issue and it takes a while to sync it up and he has to in his workflow he has to kind of sync up the footage so it matches it's a real headache and from my personal experience from seeing other people use them just avoid them they are they're, they're not that good they they obviously work um and especially in i Hotch's cases it, he was going from like Biowire 400 to 800 to Thunderbolt to Thunderbolt version this. There's just so many hurdles it has to jump over and it's that's where it's going wrong, somewhere along the line. It just doesn't work. My real recommendation is to use either a period accurate laptop. That's my strongest recommendation. Is actually find a computer or a Mac that natively supports Firewire just because there's no other like problems that you'll come into it will just work as long as it hasn't been updated too much and everything else you should be good to go and it all does depend on the software side of things as well drivers are a main thing especially on the pc side i don't know how macs work with drivers or anything um but basically drivers are just a language that makes the computer and the device talk to each other essentially and I don't think these adapters have that support or not or lack of it, so to speak. I mean, if you're nerdy enough, go ahead and write a driver. I'm not the person to ask about that. Um, but yeah, find a period accurate, like a Windows XP. Those are great. They around the mid 2000s. So we're talking Core 2 Duo, something like that. Most of them did have Firewire. I know my PC back in the day it had a firewire port it was a medium that i got from audi or something but yeah those are great um my my what i use today for capturing footage now i only had this in the last couple of years when i got my canon because i wanted to try it because i'd never tried it um i bought a firewire expansion card for a desktop pc that's my next recommendation the one I bought was a cheap Chinese one. I plugged it in, no drivers needed. Windows Update just did that all for me, and it worked. I don't have any problems with that. Um, I'll put some footage up of me, you know, setting it up. It's dead easy, um, and I do recommend the desktop computer route just because you can add these expansion cards, like a graphics card, a USB card, a FireWire card. They just really do work a lot a lot better than these adapters the adapters in my opinion weren't well i just don't think they were designed for camcorders they just don't seem to do the job very good especially the ones that convert to usb that no stay far away from those but yeah firewire if if you can't find a card under the name firewire it was commonly known on pc as i triple e 1394 yes i have to read that because i can't ever remember it um but that's that's the firewire standard so to speak so you can find cards through that uh, i've never come across the 800 ones as much so if you do have an 800 just be wary like you might have a bit of trouble maybe but do your own research and see if you can find those if you need that firewire 800 uh, port because some cameras, especially the HD ones, I think they, they had a much higher bandwidth, 800 being the bandwidth um, around that. So you need that cable to be able to capture that footage. I know that sometimes you can get away with it, but it's, it's a real headache. So just use the cable that you need with it. If you need a, a Firewire 800 capture card, get it. Yeah, those capture cards are just way better in my opinion, that's why I advise. But if you do have any trouble, just get like a period accurate piece of hardware that was around that time that supports it natively. Um, even some motherboards do support the IEEE 1394 standard. Um, you just need to have like the actual socket to go on it and then obviously to firewire. Um, I've done it with one of my old PCs I had. I just hooked up the um, front panel connector to the motherboard and you were good to go so some motherboards do support it not any modern ones by any means it's older types of motherboards 
Um, and some of these fire wire cards do support those front panel connectors, so you can obviously hook that up if you have it. Uh, yeah, I just hope that advice helps because that is the main issue that people have with capturing footage in today's world is finding something that they can capture with that works because just like the cameras are wearing out, so are the fire wires. People do not use fire wire in this day and age unless they're using something like this or, you know, they got some old files on an old hard drive that they need to get. So, yeah. Just do a lot of research on finding the right device that you need. So I just wanted to retouch a little bit more on the Windows side of things. So throughout history, I've always heard that, oh, the next version of Windows doesn't support Firewire. I can't capture my footage anymore. And it's Windows is notorious for like having issues with different devices whenever they do a Windows update. Or even, you know, obviously at this point it's just the Windows version. Uh, I remember when it was on Windows 7 and people were like, oh, Windows 8 doesn't support Firewire. It's like, I'm sure it does. You just need to find the right driver and it'll work. And that was the case. <laughs> Everyone just eventually found the right driver and it worked. Um, you, you'll see it if you know anything about computers, um, especially with graphics cards. You know, every time there's a new version of Windows or a, an update to Windows, there's normally a driver that follows. And you'll always see it on the manufacturer's website. They'll have them all dated and they'll just release a, a driver version that is compatible. And that's what this is, you know, my proof of Windows 11 with Firewire. It really does depend on the Firewire card you have. Uh, whether it's an adapter or an actual card in a desktop. You just really just need to find something that does work. Because Microsoft had no control in writing, you know, this, you know, hardware out. People can just obviously make it work. If you're nerdy enough, write a driver for it. It'll work. As long as you write the language properly and all the coding and everything, it will work. So, yeah, to... to just ignore anyone saying that Windows 11 doesn't support Firewire. They're clearly using a piece of hardware that isn't compatible any longer for whatever reason. You can always find something else that will probably work. There are occasions where certain technology is just no longer supported for whatever reason. But in this case, my Firewire card ever since Windows 7 has worked the same, so there's there's no issues there. You just need to find a Firewire card that does work. Now this is the part of the video where I think a lot of people are gonna have very harsh opinions on what I'm about to say. Now this is just my opinion on using this sort of technology now in today's in today's world. And yeah, you don't have to take it seriously. We don't have to agree, but. We can learn to disagree, okay? Like, it's not a big deal. Um, and it's, honestly, like, I don't see why people take it so seriously. Um, these cameras are considered junk. <laughs> they are old, vintage, they, they don't work great. Um, and it's the same with film. Film is still an art, by all means, but it's not, it's not how the world is advancing at all. People aren't caring for it as much, and they won't. Um, I can see in the next at least 20 years, no one will have anything that works anymore. These were so finite and very particular. Um, they need a lot of different moving parts to make them work and everything. Um, the only reason why people do it is because of how it looks. And personally, I don't know why people are using these cameras in today is just because they're not being used in the way they were designed for in the first place. People are, they, they call this deinterlacing, which if you will be using these cameras and be putting it on YouTube, etc., like that, you will be deinterlacing your footage at some point. And in my opinion, this ruins the whole aesthetic of the look of these cameras. These cameras 
if you don't know about interlacing, it is basically a field order, so it kind of films half a frame like interweaved with each other and is a very particular way on how it works and today you have to deinterlace it to be able to view it on YouTube or you know a modern LCD screen because they all use progressive scan which is just one image after the other. Interlacing is a very like blinky weird way of viewing a video and why that is is because of the old TVs the old TVs and monitors, I mean the old big box TVs that people used to have. I used to have one, I'm old enough to say that I used to have the CRT, that feels really weird saying that. CRTs, cathode ray tube, um, They, the way they view stuff is different to how a display works now. Um, people love them for all various different reasons which I won't go into, however these cameras look amazing on those old displays and that is personally where I draw the line. If I was to do a project and I was to um, say view my work I would want to view it on a display that works best with that footage. Just obviously why wouldn't you? And if you've ever seen skate videos on an old CRT display that's why they look so good. It's because that was what these cameras filmed in and that's what the display displayed in natively. And it's like trying to talk a different language to something else and it, it just doesn't, in my opinion, it just doesn't come across the same. Um, it's like part of the look of that camera. It, it, you know, obviously the, the colors are fine. You know, the colors are gonna look fine, but the frame rate and the way the display works, that's a whole different thing. And I do personally think that those displays view the VX, the Canon XM1, whichever camera, the DVX, the Panasonic ones, those cameras look best on a CRT display. And that's my opinion on it. So you can go mad at me if you want, but that's why I choose not to use these cameras in 2022 is because no one has a CRT display to display them. I mean, I have a CRT display, but even I don't even use it that much. There's, there's just no need for it. And you know, technology has moved on. I do wish that the CCDs would come back because they can, you know, uh, film in progressive scan, like even the VX. It can film progressive if it wants to. It's just obviously, a lot of people don't and for obvious reasons just because they want to keep the authenticity of these cameras as best as they can. Does it look good? No. In my opinion, now that I've used it and I've experimented with it, no, it doesn't look good. Back in the day, by all means, it looked incredible. But yeah, that basically concludes this video. So, Personally, I think if you're going to be using these cameras in 2022, you really should be displaying it on those old displays because that's where they shine the most. Um, you will know it when you see it. You'll be like, wow, these look incredible. Like the frame rate looks way better. The, the clarity of the footage looks way better. When you deinterlace it um, and put it up on YouTube, it just, it gets, it gets, like jumbled around it doesn't look that great um that's another thing i can advise people on when they when they've edited their video you should render it out at the highest possible highest possible resolution even if you're scaling it up to it i recommend uh 1080p by 1440 it's the 4 by 3 aspect ratio it will fit the 4 by 3 frame and the reason why you upscale it is just because YouTube, if you upload a 480p video like I have, <laughs> I'll probably link it in the video description, YouTube just compresses it like crazy. That's why all the old YouTube videos now just look like garbage because they've compressed them so much. They just don't look good. They just, it's a low bit rate. Um, that's why the 480 footage looks really bad because these cameras do actually film quite a high uh, bit rate in comparison to what YouTube puts up for 480p. So upscale it, 
I would do the 60 frames a second even if it's at 30 just because higher bit rate the, the image clarity will be a bit better and that's where a lot of people fail again at making these cameras shine is not deinterlacing properly and rendering in the right resolution but yeah that concludes my video I think I've covered all the recommendations and knowledge that I have uh, I honestly do think that these cameras are pretty much dead but be my guest, prove me wrong, I want to see someone kill it in this game. Um, the most recent person I've seen, and I think I Hotch will agree, Ryan, Ryan of Badgerclit. He has, that video on Coalition was incredible. He made that DVX look amazing. I think he, it was him and someone else, so I don't know what other cameras they were using, but yeah, something like this. <laughs> or, you know, the prosumer ones, like the bigger camcorders. He made it look incredible and I loved that video as well as the editing and everything else that he brought on the table with it. But yeah, I hope this video does answer a lot of questions you have with Firewire and Mini DV in general. It's not an easy thing to do at all and I don't expect any newcomer to do it. I fully recommend going HD with something that records to an SD card it's so less tedious and more convenient and just generally better quality. So up to you. Everyone has their opinion. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed and learned something. <laughs> Sorry I dragged on and started and probably repeated myself a load of times. But thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it and I hope you enjoyed.